Don't be in a, in a race to finish something. Sometimes you got to meditate on God's Word. Sometimes you read a chapter and the next day you got to go back and reread it again. Prayer is our connection to omnipotence. That's why we need to pray. If people don't pray, if Christians don't pray, what is that saying? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, hear us. We know you're hearing us, oh God. Your word tells us, oh God, that when we pray according to your will, you hear us. So we know you're hearing us right now, oh God. And Father, your word tells us that when we know that you hear us, we know that we have the things that we've asked. So God, open our eyes right now. Open our ears. We're about to open up your word. Oh, God, and we confess we need your help. Would you speak to our hearts, oh, God? Lord, we all came in here with different burdens and different things and different thoughts, but your word speaks to all of them, oh, God. Only your word can do that, Father. Speak to us now as we are listening, Lord Jesus. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name and the people of God said, amen. Can we give the Lord one more praise offering? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Right now, we're going to ask the children to start making their way to Children's Church. May they have a wonderful lesson planned for today. Amen. Well, I just want to talk to you about what the Lord dropped in my heart. And I was thinking about, you know, uh, I've been, uh, like I, I've told you before, I, I am a uh, a boxing fan, and uh, for some reason, I've always enjoyed that sport. It's a little violent, but um, uh, but one of the things I've noticed about um, combat is that when two people are facing off, and one has been trained, maybe in martial arts or maybe trained in the armed forces where they teach you hand-to-hand -hand combat, and they're... Uh, fighting against someone who has not been trained, you can tell right away when they square up to face each other. You can tell who's been trained and who is just up there fighting for their life. And usually, the trained person always wins because they've been trained for combat. And I was thinking about us as followers of Christ because when you receive Christ, you have just signed up for the spiritual battle of your life. You're in a spiritual battle anyway, but now you happen to have signed up on the winning side. How many say amen? amen. But still, we have to learn how to fight. The Apostle Paul talked about his life as fighting. I have fought the good fight. It's an awesome fight. When you're trained and you know how to fight, the Bible is our instruction manual and it teaches us how to do spiritual warfare. And uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit. I was reading one verse and that verse just lit up to me because I saw in that one verse the path to overcoming. You know, Jesus overcame the world. How many say amen? amen? And he means for us to overcome the world and not be overcome by it. How many say amen? amen. But I'm trying to find out why a lot of Christians, followers of Christ, don't seem to be overcomers. Jesus meant for everybody to overcome once you receive him as Lord and Savior of your life. There's no super Christians. We just serve a super God. How many say amen? So we have to learn what the Bible says to lead us to the path of victory and of overcoming. The verse is in Romans chapter 12, and it's verse 12. And it says this. It says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Right there is a path 
to overcoming, and we're going to take it apart and look at it. First of all, the first part of that is generally saying, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> Romans 12, 12, be joyful in hope. That's an interesting phrase. It's not telling us to be joyful about this or that, but about hope, which is an ethereal thing, but not for Christians, not for followers of Christ. We're to be happy because of hope. We're happy because of hope. We're happy because of hope, not because of results. If as a follower of Christ, you're waiting for results to be happy, that's never going to happen. But as followers of Christ, we're not happy for results. We're happy because of hope. Let your happiness come from the hope that you have as a follower of Christ. Romans 8, 24 and 25. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. Our joy is because of the hope that we have. Let's look into this a little bit further. We're happy because... We own a priceless treasure. That's part of the hope. We have a priceless treasure. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus was teaching his disciples about this hope and this treasure that we have. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. That treasure, do you know what it is? That treasure is Jesus Christ himself. That treasure is everything that we have in Christ when we find him as our Lord and Savior. And interesting, this man, when he found it, listen, he went and sold everything that he had. Everything that he had. It didn't matter what he had. Because of the value of this treasure, he was willing, willingly, he ran to do it because of the value of it. And I, I, I want to examine among us today how valuable is your salvation as a follower of Christ? Are there things that you have not given up that you know you should, you should give up? Maybe perhaps you don't know the value of it. We know how much it costs. The cost was inexpressible. It costs what Jesus went through on the cross of Calvary. Amen? Do we value it? Will we give up everything for this treasure? If you do, if you see it that way, then you have joy in the hope of the treasure that you have. Even in your darkest moments, that hope, will follow you. How many say amen? So we're happy because of hope. We're happy because we own a priceless treasure. We're also happy because we have eternal life. Do you know what that means? I wonder, you know, sometimes when you pre repeat something or you've heard it so many times, but think of the fact, because it is a fact, it's not something, oh, that, that you know, it's a myth. No, we're going to live in eternity with Jesus forever and ever. Those of us in the room who are a little older, like myself, you know, that thought is pretty amazing because, you know, I'm, I'm rounding the bend here. But I'm not heading to the finish. I'm heading to the start of forever. Amen. Amen. And that keeps my hope up. How about you? Do you think of eternity, or are you all caught up with this little temporary world? Everything in this world is temporary. There's nothing that you have that's going to last forever. Amen? So we're happy because we have eternal life. Then we're also happy because we're going to enjoy, enjoy eternity in heaven with the one that we love. Jesus, does that excite you, that you're going to be with Jesus, face to face, forever and ever. Do you, do you love him enough 
that you're waiting and excited to see him? I have the questions for you. Because if you're not, then you're not really seeing the value of the treasure that we have. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about, there's a lot of scenery. Uh, you know, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. And there's a lot of concrete and a lot of buildings. Uh, you know, and a city has its own beauty. But when you go out and see, that's man's creation. But when you see what God created and you get out into the open and you see the wonder of what God made, oh, my goodness, it blows me away. You know, sometimes when you see something so, so beautiful, sometimes you're moved to tears by it. Sometimes, you know, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, we were driving home from church and uh, it had rained. And as we were driving home, there was a huge rainbow from one side to the other. It was just huge. And it reminded me of God's promise never to flood the earth again. And it just blessed my socks off. And the other day, I was saying it a, a few weeks ago, we, my wife and I just took a drive. We like to take drives out to nowhere and just see where we head up. And we wound up in some little mountains or whatnot. And there was this lookout where you, uh, it was a wooden deck, but the, it had like a uh, something that jutted out into the open. And when you stood out there, it felt like you were kind of like in midair. And all you could see is the valley and the trees. And it was awe-inspiring. When you think about spending eternity with Jesus and where he is and what heaven is like, there's this song. It's a folk song. It's not a song uh, to inspire. Well, it's not a worship song as we know it. It's a folk song. But I remember the first time I heard it. And every time I hear it, it moves me deeply. And it's about a man on a lazy summer afternoon. And he falls. He's sitting in a rocking chair. And he falls into a deep, deep sleep. And this is what he sings. It says, deep enough. The, the, he's such a deep sleep is deep enough to dream in brilliant colors I have never seen. Deep enough to join a billion people for a wedding feast. Deep enough to reach out and touch the face of the one who made me. And all oh, the love I feel and all oh, the peace, do I ever have to wake up? And then he continues, he says, because peace is pouring over my soul. He's talking about being in heaven. See the lambs and the lions playing. I join in and I drink the music. Holiness is the air that I'm breathing. My faithful heroes break the bread and answer all of my questions, not to mention what the streets are made of. My heart's held hostage by this love and these brilliant colors I have never seen. I join a billion people for a wedding feast and I reach out and touch the face of the one who made me. Oh boy, we have... No idea. We have no idea. Sometimes we look at things and they look so beautiful. But, you know, it's beautiful because God created it. How many say amen? amen. But because of sin, the, the world is fading. You know that. It's corruptible. Uh, it, it also kind of is dying at the same time. I have proof of it in my backyard. This neighbor's huge limb broke off and fell on my side of the yard. And it's, it's like a tree, and it was a limb from this huge tree. Why? Because everything here has an end to it. But, but, but not for us. It's not going to be that always. Imagine, I'm telling you what, when we get our first glimpse of heaven... Paul seemed to have gotten a glimpse of heaven, and he, he was in a, in a situation. He didn't know whether he wanted to stay or go. The only reason to stay, he said, was to help the Christians here to continue their walk. But he says, better if I go. If we only had a glimpse of what God has prepared for us, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared for those who love him. So when troubles come your way, don't worry. Be happy. Rejoice in hope. How many say amen? Here's the second part 
of the road to overcoming. Don't hurry through your trouble. And that's a little strange, but this is what the word says. The second part of it, patient in affliction. Be joyful in hope and patient in affliction. Let me give you the definition of the word affliction. A state of pain, distress, or grief, misery. Patient in affliction. How many know those things are also a part of life here on this earth? We have our joyful moments, thank God. We have our blessed moments, thank God. But I believe everybody here in this room have experienced pain, grief, distress, and sometimes misery. But I want to tell you something about it and why we shouldn't be so, so upset and, and rushing through it. It's because when the, lo the Lord allows trouble... He is teaching you something. When the Lord allows trouble, he is teaching you something. If you don't get it, you're going to do what the Israelites did for 40 years in the desert. They're gonna take, you're going to take a lap around the desert again until you learn what the, what the Lord is trying to teach you. Listen to Isaiah chapter 30, verses 20 to 22. Though the Lord gave you adversity for food, and suffering for drink, he will still be with you to teach you. You will see your teacher with your own eyes. Your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, a voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. Then you will destroy all your silver idols and your precious gold images. You will throw them out like filthy rags, saying to them, good riddance. How many can admit here that perhaps it was trouble or pain that let you go of some things that were destructive in your life? Perhaps if we wouldn't have gone through it, we would be still holding on to things. It's like trying to hold on to a radioactive bar or something and someone saying, let that go, that's going to kill you. No, I like it, I love this thing. But you go through some suffering Oh, maybe you will let go and forget about it, and your life will be spared. How many say amen? amen? The Lord is teaching us something. Listen, when you hang on to Jesus in your trouble, the ride becomes more manageable. When you hang on to Jesus, your ride here becomes more manageable. Romans 5, 3 to 5. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. You know, when I'm, when I'm going through trouble and a situation, and, uh, you know, this past week was a difficult one for my wife and I uh, uh, because of the loved one that's going through something. But because of Jesus and the hope that we have, I know that whatever it is that we're going through, how many know God loves you? How many know what his plans are for you? What are they? Somebody tell me. That's right. To give us a hope and a future. Not to harm us. You know, uh, I'm older than a lot of you in the room. God has never harmed me. Oh, I've been through some trouble. Oh, I've been through some pain. But God has never harmed me. You know, when you have an operation of a tumor or something that's malignant and the surgeon goes in and cuts you to take it out, you hurt for a while. How many know what I'm talking about? Or you get knee replacement surgery, which I haven't had yet. Well, I'm only saying yet. I'm not going to confess that. <laughs> that I'll never have. <laughs> Afterwards, it's quite painful 
and you have to build up your strength again. But there's something good that happened. Isn't it great that that growth is not in your body anymore? So you put up with the pain knowing that something has just been taken out of you that would have killed you. In the same way, it's that kind of pain many times that saves us spiritually. If it wasn't for that pain, if it wasn't for God having to do something, we'd be lost. So we glory in what God does because everything he does is for our good because he loves you more than you can ever imagine. Did you know that you can learn about God's love in times of trouble? I've seen my share, and i got to tell you, I love him. I love him more than anything on this earth. Anything. But I learned that. You know, there was a time where I loved God, and I know if I ask you all right now, Do you love God? You're all going to raise your hand, just like I would have. But I found out one day in my life that loving God is not enough. The Bible tells us, love God with all of your heart and all of your strength and all of your mind and all of your soul. And if we don't love him like that, we get ourselves in trouble. It's not that we serve a needy God. It's that we need to love God that way so that we won't go off because of the condition that we're in because of our sinful nature. And you know what got me there? Trials. Some suffering. Some pain. God was doing surgery on me. Doing surgery. And by the way, I needed a lot of surgery. Boy, I was infested. But God, and he's still working, you know. Sometimes you go and you have these huge operations, right? And, and then you go to the dermatologist. And he has to remove a little growth. There's always something that needs to be cut out. How would he say amen? God is still working on me. Amen. You learn about love. During times of trouble. Listen to Lamentations chapter 3, starting in verse 19. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet, I will dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. How many say amen? Amen. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercy begin afresh every morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. You learn about the love of God through your trials. You know why that is? Because before that, we're not thinking about him. Before that, our mind is on a hundred other things, a thousand other things. But when we're in a situation and our back is against the wall, oh, do we focus on God. And what we learn is this, that he is good and his love endures forever. And he rescues us and he restores us. How many say amen? He is also why you don't hurry through your trouble because you're not alone through your trouble. You're not alone. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, the Lord speaking through the prophet, don't be afraid, for I am with you. Let me just stop there. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. If you were conscious of the fact, if you walk with the Lord, and he is walking with you, and you're conscious of the fact, Let me ask you a simple question. Do you have to be afraid of anything? No, you don't. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. 
You're not alone in your trouble. David knew this. That's why he could say, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Why? Because you are with me. He makes all the difference in the world of where you walk. That's why you have to remember Jesus through your trouble. You know, uh, I can't tell you how many times, um, you know, when, when trouble comes, don't, don't get me wrong, don't look at me thinking that I want trouble or that I'm inviting trouble or that I love trouble. I don't. I just appreciate it. Because I know God is going to take me to a place I haven't been before in knowing him. And whenever trouble comes, my heart goes back to, okay, but I belong to Jesus. Okay, but However this plays out, my life belongs to him, and I know where I'm going. However this shakes out, however God does it, and I love Romans 8, 28, he works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But even if he doesn't, he will. But even if he doesn't, yet will I serve him. You know, I was reading the book of Job and that's a little painful to read through it because of everything that Job went through, but it's very, very interesting. And uh, Job, in the middle of his complaints, I mean, Job, uh, you know, <laughs> greater person than I could ever be, when, when everything first happened and he lost everything, including his children, he, the Bible says he bowed down in worship. And he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, my goodness. Has that portion of scripture ever spoken to me through my life? But then his body started suffering. And he became miserable because when your body is sick, it's just. So he began to complain a little bit. And, and ask for an audience with God. If God would only, I would love to just talk to him and, and, and find out why he's done this to me or why he put his hand on me. But then in the middle of all of that, when he's speaking, he has like a, a revelation in the midst of all of that, in the midst of his suffering, in the midst of kind of uh, pouring out his heart about his complaint. He says this in Job chapter 19, verse 25. He just comes right out in the middle of it and he says, but as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that he will stand upon the earth at last after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. And it's good for us to remember when we're going through something and, and you know, you have your enemy there telling you how miserable everything is and you know, and trying to push you down even further. He wants to just make you a big zero in, in, for the advancement of the kingdom of God. So depression and discouragement are like cancer for Christians from the, in their spirit. But you know what? I pray for moments of revelation for all of you and for me too. I've had them. When I'm starting to feel a little, oh man, this is, this is kind of heavy. But like Job says, and then I remember, wait a minute, but I know that my Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. The one who saved me. The one who loved me. The one that knows everything I've ever done, yet still loves me. That one. My Redeemer. You know, we read about the woman at the well. And she couldn't believe. She went out screaming after Jesus told her the truth of who he was, and she believed it. She, you know what she went out telling people? He told me everything I've ever done. 
Boy, if, if someone told you everything you've ever done, would you be shouting it in the streets? But you know why she was doing that? This is what she was really saying. He knows everything I've ever done, and he still loves me. And there's still hope for me. And there's salvation even for me. Oh, I know that my Redeemer lives. When you're down and out, when you are feeling crushed, oh, know this, your Redeemer lives. It's not over. It's never over for a follower of Christ. It's never over. I don't think, I don't care what things look like. I've been in places where I said, well, this is it. There's no way out of this one. Oh, yeah? There is a way out. Jesus is the way out. Don't hurry through your trouble. Jesus is working things out in you. Amen. Timmy, if you come. The final part of our scripture, the one verse, this is the lesson we get out of it. Keep going to Jesus for everything. Joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Keep going to Jesus for everything. Keep going to Jesus for everything. I'm talking about everything. I bother Jesus for a lot of little things now. You know, when I was a kid, I grew up in church. My mom was a fervent believer. My dad didn't get saved until I was 15. But I look back on the prayers that I used to ask Jesus, and they were very silly. Silly little, you know, maybe my toy wasn't working. You know, Jesus, could you fix my toy? Did you know that he would answer those little prayers? And, uh, you know, I grew up and I got more sophisticated. (laughs) You know, now go only to him with sophisticated things, with very, very serious things. I got the rest. I'll handle the rest. Just help me out with the big ones. But boy, I need help with those little ones. And I, you know, I was, <laughs> it hit me one day. Well, why, why shouldn't I ask him? He's my father, isn't he? I remember how I used to pester my dad for everything. You know, my dad, my dad in my mind could fix anything. Any little thing. I want bubble gum, dad. Now, I don't ask God for bubble gum, but I do go to him for little things because he's made the way open for me. And yeah, you know what? Those little things keep me so connected to him so that when that big thing comes, I don't have to first go find him or where I left him. You know, Jesus never leaves you, but that doesn't say anything about you leaving God. You can leave him. How many know what I'm talking about? How many, how many have been on some trips without God? So keep asking like a child does. Matthew 7, 7 says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will will be open to you. Keep asking like a child does. Jesus tells us, the Bible tells us, I should say, you have not because you ask not. We were talking about prayer on Tuesday and and we were talking about hindrances to prayer and you know what the biggest hindrance to prayer is? I said it on Tuesday. The biggest hindrance to prayer is not praying. If you don't pray, you're not going to get any answers. Amen? In order to see God move in your life, you have to pray. Faithful in prayer. So you keep asking. You keep believing. There's a story in Scripture, a very famous story about a father who had a demon-possessed son, and he took him to the disciples, and they couldn't do anything with him. And Jesus came, 
And he said, what's going on? And they told him, and he said, oh, you little faith, how long do I have to be with you before you learn? And then, here's what the father said when he was appealing to Jesus in Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 22. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Imagine telling Jesus, God, the creator of the entire universe, if you can do anything, if you can do anything, have pity on us and help us. And Jesus' response was, if you can? Is that what you're saying? If I can? Then he said, everything is possible for the one who believes. Believing in Jesus, believing in what he said, believing in the word of God is powerful. It's powerful. People who have faith in what Jesus said and faith in Jesus Christ, they live different kind of lives than everybody else. They see God move things. Faithful in prayer. Amen. You have to keep asking. You have to keep believing and then you have to keep clinging to Jesus. I love uh, in the book of Jeremiah, God describes what he meant, the kind of relationship that he meant to have with Israel, with his people, with Judah, the people of Jerusalem. God made us for an intimate relationship with him. That's why we're here, by the way. If you want to know your purpose, here's your purpose, to have an intimate relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's your purpose. His plans, he'll work them out in your life. But here's how God describes what he meant. Jeremiah 13, 11. For as the loincloth clings to the waist of a man... So I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory, but they would not listen. And if you read the history of Israel and of Judah, they didn't wind up very well. But if they would have clinged to Jesus, if they would have clinged to their God, like a loincloth clings to a man's waist. It would have been a different history. But the mercy of God. But the mercy of God. You know, as I read through the prophets, I'm reading through Jeremiah right now. And God keeps promising, even with all the judgment, that he's going to have mercy and bring them back. And if you look back today, right, thousands of years later, a couple of thousand years later, he did bring him back, and he's not finished with them yet. What I'm trying to say is this. God means for you and me to cling to him. I've learned that. I wish I knew that earlier. I wish I wasn't so thick-headed. I wish I wasn't so stubborn because I could have spared myself a lot of grief. Now, the grief did teach me something. But you know, it's not written that the, you have to learn through heavy trials. If you pray and you have a relationship with God, some of the horrible things we go through of our own doing, we would be spared from. How many went their own way and found out? Oh, man, I'm in a place, and I don't know how I'm going to get out. But, but we went there ourselves. How many honest people do we have in the room? So you know what I learned? When it comes to God, I'm clinging to him. Kevin, I'm clinging to him like Logan's going to cling to your leg. One day you're going to get up to go to work and Logan's going to cling to your leg. He's not going to want to let you go. That's how I cling to Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm just not letting go. Not letting go for a second. I can't 
I won't. Doesn't make sense to. And I pray that all of you learn to cling to Jesus because if you do, you will be an overcomer. So stop worrying. Be joyful because of the inheritance that you have in Christ Jesus. How many say amen? Be patient through trouble because God is teaching you something. And you'll come out better at the end of it. How many say amen? And keep going to Jesus. And you will be an overcomer here until the day that you see your Lord face to face. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord God, that you not only saved us. Salvation is awesome, God. We don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. It's a gift from you, and we thank you, Lord. We praise you. But you didn't save us just to leave us like that and for us to figure things out here until we see you. You meant for us to be so transformed and to be so filled with your life God, that we would be overcomers as you overcame the world. Lord, that the things that, that, that throw us off or, or knock us down, Lord God, wouldn't ever have the power to do that. You didn't leave us as orphans, oh God. But Lord, you do ask something from us, Lord God. You ask us, oh God, to be joyful in the hope, oh God, that we have in Christ Jesus. To understand, Lord, that we're not here, oh God, to make a way of it, oh God. We're just passing through here, Lord Jesus. With a purpose, oh God, to advance the kingdom and tell as many people about you as we can before we see you face to face. God, if we live that way, we'll be joyful in hope because of the hope that we have. And God, as we go through, Lord God, in this corruptible world, oh God, our bodies get sick. Sometimes there's pain, there's grief in our soul sometimes because we went through something. God, help us to be patient and trust you through that, oh God. And know, oh Lord God, that you have not left your throne. You have not forgotten about us, oh God. You have not left us alone. But you're working out things in us, oh God, that need to be worked out. And God, I pray that you would also make us faithful in prayer. God, that we would have a hunger to speak to you, that we would learn to run to you for everything and with everything, oh God, that you would be our first stop, not our last stop, oh God, so that, Lord, we can be overcomers, oh God, and we can be about your business, Lord Jesus, that we would say like the Apostle Paul, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's a win-win situation that you left for us, oh God. Help us. Help your people, God. Help each one of us, oh God. Live in the victory, oh God, that you left for us. You say to us that we are more than overcomers through Christ. Help us to live that way, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, with our heads bowed and eyes closed, if there's someone here that maybe you, you, you're not following Christ, you're not walking with him, maybe uh, one time you were and and something happened and threw you off. Or maybe you've never followed him. If those of you at home that are listening, maybe that's you. Maybe God is speaking to you right where you are. God knows where you are. He knows exactly, pinpoint your location. He doesn't need GPS. And right where you are, he's speaking to your heart. If there's someone here that needs to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, come back into a relationship with him. I'd like to know who you are by you raising your hand. If you raise your hand, I want to pray with you. Anybody here who needs to make that decision and be restored or be renewed in Christ Jesus. Anybody who needs to restore their relationship with Jesus Christ or start a new relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe those, anybody at home who needs that. If that's you, raise your hand right there where you are. Even if you're alone, God will see it. I'm going to pray, believing that someone is hearing me that needs to make that decision. And if you did raise your hand, repeat after me. Say this prayer. God will hear it as if it's yours. Say, dear Lord Jesus, today I recognize, oh God, that I'm a sinner and that I need you. And Lord, I confess 
that you are Jesus, the Son of God. You're the Messiah. I confess that you died on the cross for my sins and for the sins of the world. And I confess and I believe that you rose on the third day in victory. Today, Lord, I want that victory. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me in the blood that you spilled on Calvary's cross. I give you my heart and my life in Jesus' name. Father, thank you, Lord, for anyone who's prayed that prayer with me, Lord. According to your word, right now they are part of your family, the family of God. And, Lord, they are saved. They have salvation. Eternity is promised and secure. Father, I pray that you would be with them from this point forward in the next steps, O oh God, of walking through and learning how to speak to you in prayer, O oh God, and how to read scripture and, and hear your voice through it, Father. I pray all these things, Father, in Jesus' name, with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you're here today. And you need help in one of those areas or all three of those areas. Maybe you need to be reminded of being joyful in the hope that you have. Maybe you've forgotten. Maybe you haven't been patient in affliction. Maybe you've done like what we all do, complain. And maybe you haven't been so faithful in prayer. If you want God to help you and give you a special dispensation of his grace and power, would you raise your hand? I just want to pray for you. Yes, there's hands all over this building. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, for everyone that you've spoken to personally. God, I know your word speaks personally to everyone, Lord Jesus. God, I pray, O oh Lord God, that, Lord, like your word says, not only, O oh Lord God, do we have salvation, but your word tells us that the same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is available to us. I pray, God, that you would endue that power to every believer that raised their hand, oh God, asking for help so that, Lord, they will remember. They will remember like Job remembered. I know that my Redeemer lives. No matter what I'm going through, it's going to be okay. And so that, Lord, when affliction comes, God, they will know and run to you and know, Father, that their very life is in your hands, oh God. They don't need to fear. And, Father, that they would have a hunger, God, to go to your throne of grace in prayer, Lord Jesus. Father, I ask this, oh, God, for the maturing and the growth of your people. And, Lord, I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Can we all stand?